एफ आर एम पार्ट वन फाइनेंशियल मार्केट एंड प्रोडक्ट नेक्स्ट टेम स्टेटमेंट इज कॉर्पोरेट बॉन्ड्स हियर वील अंडरस्टैंड वॉट इज अ बॉन्ड इंडेंचर एंड वॉट इज द रूल ऑफ अ कॉर्पोरेट ट्रस्टी इन द बॉन्ड इंडेंचर देन वी लुक एट द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ मेच्योरिटी डेट ऑफ द बॉन्ड एंड हाउ डज इट इम्पैक्ट द रिटायरमेंट देन वी लुक एट वेरियस टाइप्स ऑफ इंटरेस्ट पेमेंट क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ बॉन्ड्स we'll also describe zero coupon bonds and their relationship between original issue discount and reinvestment risk and how are they treated in case of bankruptcy we'll also look at various security types for example mortgage bonds collateral trust bonds equipment trust certificates debenture bonds guaranteed bonds etc we'll also look at the mechanism by which corporate bonds can be retired before their maturity so these mechanism will include call provisions which is embedded in the bond there could be sinking fund provision there could be maintenance and replacement fund etc we'll also differentiate between the credit default risk and credit spread risk we'll also look at the event risk and how does it impact a corporate bond we look at the high yield bonds and their specific payment features we we'll also differentiate between the issuer default rate and the dollar default rate and finally we we'll understand the concepts of recovery rates and the relationship between recovery rate and the seniority so let us start so we have already talked about the concept of bond indenture this establishes the obligation of the issuer and the rights of the investors so all those conditions are mentioned in the indenture which could include positive covenants as well as negative covenants positive covenants are the conditions which should be met by the issuer and the negative covenants include the prohibitions for the issuer which are mentioned in the indenture in order to protect the investors so overall this bond indenture is a legal document which provide the obligations and the rights in detail now let us look at the role of corporate trustee here usually the banks or trust companies play the role of the corporate trustee who represent the interest of the bond investors and they interpret the bond indenture so on behalf of the investors they interpret the bond indenture so that they can protect the interest of the bond investors they will also authenticate the issue which includes keeping track of the amounts of bonds issued and they make sure that the number does not exceed the limit which has been specified in the bond indenture according to the trust indenture act for all corporate bonds where offering is above 5 million dollars it is mandatory to have a corporate trustee let us move to the next concept various corporate bonds in united states broadly there are five categories of corporate bonds which are based on the type of issuer so first is the public utilities if they are the issuer it is one kind of corporate bond it could be industrial it could be transportation there could be certain international issues for example yankee bonds etc then there could be banks and financial companies which are issuing these corporate bonds now let us look at further classification of corporate bonds now it is based on the various security types which are relevant to the corporate bonds one of them is mortgage bond where certain property has been mortgaged so that the lender is protected then we have collateral trust bonds so when the company does not have any fixed asset to pledge or any other real property they usually pledge treasury securities or the securities of other companies so the bond which are secured by these kind of assets are called collateral trust bonds then we have equipment trust certificates 
So these kind of certificates are very common in case of railroads, etc. And they are also used in airlines. Then we have debenture bonds, which are unsecured. There is no collateral. That is why they are called unsecured debenture bonds. And finally, we have guaranteed bonds, where one corporation may guarantee the bonds of another corporation. But this guarantee does not mean that default risk has been totally eliminated, but it depends on the financial capability of the guarantor as well. Let us move to the next topic, bond maturity. Every bond has a maturity date. This date is when the bond issuer's obligations are fulfilled. So whatever has been promised in the starting has been fulfilled till the end of this period. So that date is called maturity date. So usually all the interest payments have been made and finally at the end of maturity even the principal is paid back. But the companies may have an option to retire the bond even earlier than the maturity date. There are multiple mechanisms for termination of the bond before its maturity date. We'll look into those mechanisms. The maturity date also represent the interest rate risk the bond is going to have. So if the time to maturity is high, the interest rate is going to be high. It is directly proportional. On the other hand, the reinvestment risk is going to be lower. So if the time to maturity is high, reinvestment risk is going to be relatively lower. So these two risks are directly related to the bond maturity. Now let us move to the next slide. Based on the interest payment, we can classify these bonds into multiple categories. Let us look at them one by one. The simple cases of straight coupon bonds, which are also known as fixed rate bonds. So there is one fixed coupon rate, which is mentioned in the bond. It is usually paid semi-annually. The par value is also mentioned, which is paid in the end or at the maturity date. Then we have floating rate bonds where the coupon rate is not fixed, it is floating. Usually it is tied to a reference rate and based on that reference rate, it could be LIBOR we can calculate the floating rate interest. So in this case, the interest rate risk is going to be zero. Since the coupon rate is automatically adjusting to the prevalent rate in the market, so there will be practically no interest rate risk. Then we have participating bonds where bondholders are actually participating in the profits of the company but at the minimum they get a fixed rate but if the company is making profits more than the specified number they get a share of the profit as well so the fixed rate does not remain fixed they get a higher rate on the similar lines we have income bonds where at max, they get a fixed rate, but if the company is losing, they get less than the fixed rate. So these are called income bonds. So here the upper limit is fixed, but lower limit is not fixed. In the case of participating bonds, the lower limit is fixed, but upper limit is not fixed. Then we have zero coupon bonds, which are issued at a discount from these par value. At maturity, we receive par value and no coupon is paid. Usually, the price is mentioned in terms of original issue discount, OID, which could be calculated as the difference of the face value and the offering price. For example, if the face value is 
hundred dollar and it is being offered at say ninety eight dollar, then two dollar is going to be the original issue discount. So this two dollar can be said to be interest component, which is paid actually in the end along with the value. So overall, we are going to get hundred dollar, which is the face value of the bond. At the time of maturity, in the starting, the bondholder is paying ninety-eight, which is the offering price. So the difference is original issue discount. And since there is no coupon paid, the reinvestment risk in the case of zero coupon bond is going to be zero. On the other hand, the interest rate risk is going to be very high in the case of zero coupon bond. Since so the interest rate is fixed, they are very sensitive to any change in the interest rate. So whenever there is a small rise in the interest rate, the price of the zero coupon bond falls. Now let us move to the next topic, which is the methods for retiring a bond prior to its maturity. There might be multiple mechanisms. Let us look at them one by one. There could be a call provision which is embedded in the bond itself. It could be mentioned that the issuer can call the bond. At a future date prior to its maturity, so first kind is fixed price call where a price is also mentioned. That suppose it is a hundred dollar par value bond with a maturity of ten years. It might have been communicated with this bond that after five years, the bond could be called at ninety eight dollars. So this would be the call price. This kind of call is understood as fixed price call, and then there could be a make whole call, which is called so because the price at which it is going to be called is not fixed; it is market driven. Because in the previous case, the price also was given in the bond conditions, but in the case of make whole call, it is market driven. Then we have sinking fund provision. The firm retires a specified portion of debt every year, which is also already outlined in the indenture as well. Then we have maintenance and replacement funds. Here too, the goal is same as the sinking fund provision, which is to maintain the credibility of the property which is backing the fund. But in the case of maintenance and replacement fund, the provisions are little more complex because it requires the valuation formula for the underlying assets. Finally, we have tender offers, which usually mean for retiring the debt through buying back certain number of bonds. So the firm provides an offer price. If that price is very attractive. Then the bondholders will sell the bond back to the issuer. Otherwise, the company has to increase the price to attract some more bondholders so that they can retire certain amount of funds. Let us move to the next topic: credit risk. So there are two major kinds of credit risk: credit default risk and credit spread risk. Credit default risk arises when a party is not able to pay its interest. which is coupon payment or the principal and the credit spread risk arises when the credit worthiness of a company comes down and due to that the spread goes up and the price of the bond falls so this spread risk focus on the difference between the bond's yield and the yield of a comparable bond which is a treasury security so the difference is called credit spread so if the spread becomes large and the price of the bond comes down so as we already know that the interest rate risk is measured through the concept of duration which is a parameter which measures the interest rate risk similarly to measure credit spread risk we have spread duration so this says if there is a 1% change in the spread what is the fall in the price so that gives the idea of spread duration the other kind of credit risk is event risk so there could be a specific event 
related to the company's business which can reduce the credit worthiness of the company so this kind of risk is called event risk so it could be any adverse consequence which is coming from the operation of the company or it could be any mergers or acquisition etc so these kind of risks are not usually covered in the bond indenture but they are related to the business operation or the economy in which the company is operating that is why these kind of risks are dealt separately the high yield bonds are specific bonds which are usually traded at a very low price because the interest rate which they are offering is high due to low credit worthiness of them they are also called junk bonds because their credit rating is below the investment grade so the possibility of these kind of companies being successful is low but the returns are high so they are high yield bonds so they provide high risk and accordingly high returns now let us move to the next concept the concept of default rate as we understand a default occurs when there is a missed payment or delayed payment of interest or the principal related to the bond so how do we measure the rate of default we have multiple default rate concepts one is the issuer default rate so this is calculated as the number of issuers which default over a year divided by the total number of issuers at the beginning of the year so what percentage of issuers have defaulted in a particular year is provided by issuer default rate but this does not capture the size of default so we have another parameter which is dollar default rate this is given by the par value of all bonds which are defaulted in a given year divided by total par value of all the bonds outstanding that year so this takes the value of the bond in the account and the first parameter just look at the number of issuers who are defaulting another related concept is recovery rate so in case when the bond is defaulting this is the amount which is received as a proportion of total obligation suppose there was a bond which was supposed to pay 100 dollar but it has defaulted it was not able to pay 100 dollar it could pay only 30 dollar so that says our recovery rate is 30% though the bond is defaulting still we are able to recover some percentage of the total obligation which is understood as recovery rate so these were the basics of corporate bonds thank you